let me uh, ask you, uh, Harry, one, one of the biggest uh, concerns that we have recently uh, is the issue of the, um, of the cardiovascular uh, adverse events that we're starting to recognize more uh, in, in the setting of, of the tyrosine kinase uh, inhibitor therapy. Some drugs may have a little bit more than others, but we're, we're seeing it with many of them. Um, so, so that brings the question of, you, you know, how do you follow a patient uh, for, these, uh, for the, these side effects, again, focusing on these arterial thrombotic events, and do you do, you do it by yourself? Do you engage a, a, one of your cardiologist colleagues or, or somebody else uh, in, in assessing this? So there is no doubt that um, after a long follow-up of the trials of the second generation uh, TKI trials, we, we start to recognize these long-term uh, side effects, and definitely maybe the cardiovascular ones are the ones who concern us uh, the most, right? Um, everyone has their own setting. I think um, we're talking a lot about the, the role of cardio-oncologists. Cardio-oncologists are not really available in many, many places. However, well, as every specialty seems like a, they, are, they are coming to board because there is not only a CML, there is breast cancer, there is many other uh, BGF inhibitor who really have uh, an important impact in the cardiovascular health. So I think we're gonna see these, these, um, these specialists coming more and more, and I think we need to start to really work with them. For now on, I don't think that we have much that we can offer in terms of uh, of uh, what we're gonna do. Of course, prophylaxis is the, the, the things that we recommend and we work. But there is no doubt that the, the incorporation of these specialists that in the future may assess uh, how to better control the risk, and there is no doubt they are more up to date in any other areas that we are not really so specialized. I think it's gonna have an important role in the, in the future treatment of these long-term patients on TKI. But, but let me, um, you know, for a different, uh, a different perspective. Um, part of the problem that we see with, with some of these patients that have developed these arterial thrombotic events is that uh, these are patients that have risk factors. They have hypertension and hypercholesterolemia and, and diabetes and, and all these things. And, and that perhaps, and I think it was shown in some of these studies, like the PACE study with panatinib, that uh, we were not very good at controlling their blood pressure, and we were not very good at controlling their, their cholesterol and, and all these things. So it, perhaps we don't even need a cardio-oncologist. We just need a cardiologist, somebody who, 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 who is a, a little bit more dedicated and more knowledgeable about managing these common issues, and that if you address them better, perhaps we can decrease the risk. We're probably not gonna eliminate it, but perhaps we're gonna improve it. Do, do you Right, I, I fully agree. I mean, I, I, I talk about the role of, the potential role of cardio-oncology, but once again, cardio-oncology, you're gonna find in a tertiary institution, in large cancer center, in the real life, they are not gonna be there. So I think we, one our role is to, to try to educate the local cardiologists that most of our patients after 65, 70 may have, to really let them be aware of these side effects and, and again, the first time or the first uh, time I met a patient or a patient who is already in a TKI who has potential long-term cardiovascular effect, I will really, really emphasize, okay, let me give me the number of your cardiology or let me, let me talk to them or, or if you are really educated enough, let them know that you're in a drug who can increase your cardiovascular profile. Okay. Um, somewhat related to this, Kevin, uh, because these events are arterial thrombotic and... Um, and we worry about heart attacks and strokes and, and whatever. Um, do, you, do you see a role for using prophylactic aspirin or, or statins on patients that are gonna start with, I don't know, panathenib, nilotinib, maybe dasatinib? Do yeah, certainly, I think this is gonna be a major issue, particularly as we move forward and these patients stay on these medications longer and longer. I think the incidence of cardiovascular side effects is up to nearly 9% with some of the second generation TKI, so it's quite significant. So what I do, each patient I have, I just address the cardiovascular risk factors, smoking, hypertension, family history. If they do have any cardiovascular risk factors, I have a, do a risk-benefit ratio analysis in terms of starting aspirin. And I, I have started some patients on aspirin who are on uh, TKIs. And I do check a lipid profile once a year. I just do it myself because I'm, I'm not, I can't guarantee that it's going to be done otherwise. And if, and if it's high, I'll, I'll start a statin uh, because I feel responsible because I prescribed the TKI in the first place. I don't want the patient to get a cardiovascular side effect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, All right, um, so, so David, just to, to wrap up a little bit about this issue of toxicity, um, can you give us uh, you know, two or three pearls on, on your wisdom on, on, on what should the uh, 
physician treating a patient with CML, uh, with a TKI, what are the important things that we need to remember about managing adverse events in general? Of course, right. importantly, the arterial thrombotic, but, but in general, uh, adverse events. Right. Well, I, I think the most important ones are, are the, the, the um, cardiovascular type of, of, of toxicities, pulmonary as well, as, as, as we know. Um, I think it's important for the community-based uh, physicians to be aware of these risks. And I would go beyond that. I, I think it's incumbent upon us to educate our non-hematology colleagues uh, in the community, the cardiologists, the pulmonologists, who may be the first ones to see uh, some of these patients uh, with these complications, uh, to, to increase the level of awareness uh, at that point. I think most hematologists are probably not going to be comfortable being primarily responsible mm. for you know, reducing risk and managing these yeah. problems, even though that, that would be ideal. Yeah. But I, I think we need to partner with our, our yeah. colleagues out there. And so they need to be uh, educated uh, about the importance of, of working with, with the hematologists uh, for these uh, kind of patients. And um, you know, in terms of uh, mitigating risk, I think there's speculation so far, not a lot of data about the value of aspirin or statins. Yeah. It kind of makes sense, but I, I think it would be good to generate uh, data showing the, yeah. uh, the value. We don't, you know, we, we presume, we assume that people who have these other traditional risk factors, that, that they should be optimally controlled, but we don't know yet that that's going to be sufficient absolutely, uh, absolutely. to eliminate these risks. Absolutely, and, and as a matter of fact, as, as you know, well, if we don't read like a cardiology literature, but every time that in any of these um, large, en enormous multicenter trials that they are done for uh, cardiovascular prevention are, are really, really large. So I think, uh, unfortunately, I don't think that we're going to be able to really see this in, in, in our a small community setting, right? So we'll have to really uh, check a little faith and say, well, we'll do this because we believe that this is going to really help. But however, we always say, oh, we'd love to really have data. I think it's going to be really challenging to have data in our I setting. think, you know, in, the, in this topic, in terms of the arterial thrombotic, I think the major deficiency we have is we still don't understand the mechanism. And Absolutely. obviously, we need to do Absolutely. those studies because yes. once we understand the mechanism, we'll be perhaps better equipped to find ways to prevent it and, and manage it. Uh, and in general, for adverse events, uh, I think that's uh, something that, that Harry mentioned earlier is very important. We need to stay connected with our patients. I mean, it's not just about the PCR. It's stay you know, very close to the patients, answering their questions and, and managing their adverse events, whatever they, they be, and make sure that they let us know when they have issues so that we can address them uh, properly. So, well, and to get back to that, you know, something that you said very quickly before, David, was about many of the toxicities are transient. And that's the case. We all mm. see patients who start on a TKI, maybe it's basutinib and they develop diarrhea, but it tends to get better. Or um, rashes or aches and pains uh, with, uh, uh, you know, imatinib and uh, uh, nilotinib and dasatinib, they tend to get better. And what we need to be very cognizant of is that you just start a patient on a drug that you told them that they're gonna have to be on for the rest of their life. And what they hear is, I'm going to feel like this for the rest of my life. The, so what I would say um, as well in terms of uh, monitoring is that at the beginning when you start therapy, I do toxicity assessments on my patients at a week, at a month, at two months, three months, and then I go to every three-month visits if they're stable because you need to help them through and manage those toxicities early on.